You have to sit in a chair and have somebody shout abuse in your face without reacting. You just have to sit and take it for a couple of hours. My mum was actually an alcoholic. If she was arguing with my dad or something, they would come to the conclusion of, well, we've got this SP in our family, get her downstairs. Mm. I literally would be asleep, woken up, three o'clock in the morning sometimes, what? would be put on the e-meter. What are your evil intentions towards us? It would just go on and on until until I gave this confession. Hey, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. As always, if you're only listening and you want to see our faces, go to my YouTube channel at Cults to Consciousness, where you can like, subscribe, comment all of your thoughts. If you have any suggestions on guests, definitely leave them below. Um, today's guest is someone who I saw on Apostate Alex's channel. They were just hanging out. I was actually on my honeymoon. First episode as a wife, you guys. <laughs> I was on my honeymoon in Bali and I'm just looking out at the beautiful ocean and this stunning villa, beachside villa, and I'm watching her story. <laughs> And she's like, it's a little dark for a honeymoon. But, you know, cults are my life now. I saw her story and it was incredible. So I welcome to the show Kelly Copter. Thank you for joining us. Hello, Shalise. Thank you so much. That intro was so nice. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> I meant to say more. Let me let me pop some in now. So your story, you grew up as a Scientologist and you were basically declared an enemy of Scientology at age six and everything that you had to endure from then until leaving. And I'm sure now you're still dealing with it is just something that is so awful for a child to go through. And you beautifully, eloquently told your story on your own YouTube channel, which we will plug. and. I just wanted to get deeper into it. I wanted to ask you a bunch of questions. Sure. So we're going to be diving in deep into your story as a child in Scientology. And then also what you wanted to focus on is your recovery and how you actually were able to get out of that situation. Yes. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay. So both of your parents were, they weren't both born and raised, right? Only one of them was born and raised in Scientology. Yeah, so my mum was born into it, or she was at least pulled into it at a very young age. And then my dad actually joined of his own volition uh, as a teenager after a friend of his told him that he could heal his cycling injuries using the technology that L. Ron Hubbard uh, provides. Interesting. Did it work? No, he actually quit cycling <laughs> oh. and never got back on a bike ever again. Very interesting. Okay. Okay. So I wanted to start here because I know you mentioned in your videos that you don't necessarily blame them for your childhood because you understand that they were also programmed. They were doing the best that they could for the information that they had. Yeah. So I just wanted to throw out that caveat. And if you have anything else to say, please do. Yeah, no, it's like a, a, a way I've come to understand it as I've got older. Um, my dad has reached out to me since as well. So he's in contact with me and I don't want to, um, you know, I, I want to kind of get to a place where I can understand why it has happened. It's kind of first accepting that it, it's not my fault that it happened and then trying to um, figure out where we go from there. But it's an ongoing process and, you know, that that communication is still still happening as well. So Yeah. Well, that's great that you've been able to rekindle a relationship with him, and I'm sure it'll only get better as time goes on. So. so let's dive into your childhood then. You start your story when you're six, at least that's how you tell it. Is that the earliest that you remember being a Scientologist and the things that come with that? Yeah, it's the earliest things I can sort of I have some vague memories of. Um, I had to. I had to actually ask my dad about this when he started talking to me because I remembered um, this this experience of having an exorcism when I was when I was six years old, and I we hadn't really talked about it at all until my dad got in touch, and I was like, "Look, I I remember this happening." Did it happen? Like, is that a real thing that happened to me? Because it it sounds crazy, um, and and he confirmed that for me. He was like, "Yes, yes, it did happen." Um, and he was like a OT five in Scientology, which is quite 
high up the bridge. Um, so he has learned about body thetans and um, they do self exorcisms on themselves. So he took it upon himself to um, use this on me. Wow. Uh, and try to get rid of my evil body thetan spirits, whatever, uh, because um, they had been having some problems in Scientology and uh, they. Uh, recommended me for a sec check which is a, a security check um they do these on children um, and adults as well if you have any sort of uh, doubts or problems if someone leaves Scientology you'll be pulled in for a security check um and they ask you all of these wild questions and I apparently failed this and they informed my parents that I was a potentially a suppressive person and wow. that they needed to handle me or they needed to disconnect from me, which could have been um, boarding school or adoption. Oh my gosh, adoption. I can't believe that was even on the table. Yeah. I'm curious, do you remember any of the questions that they asked you in the security check? You know, I can't remember exactly from being sat there. Like I can kind of remember the room and stuff, but um, I have looked at the questions since because there is a uh, a page that's like, these questions are security check questions that are for children between ages six and 12. And they're things like, um, have you ever um, disobeyed someone you were supposed to obey? Do you have a secret? Um, what has somebody told you not to tell? Have you ever done something when you were supposed to be in bed or asleep? Those kind of questions. Um, and they get weird and crazy when you go, um, when you do them as an adult. I'm not sure if these are on the, ch the uh, children's security check, but they ask you things like, have you ever been a communist? You know, have you ever made a planet radioactive? Wait, what? Just wild. <laughs> what? How could anyone actually In a past do life, that? Of course. Oh, got it. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that must have been so scary as a kid. Because, of course, kids have disobeyed their parents. Of course, they've had secrets. I mean, you're a kid, so yeah, that seems extremely normal. And then after the security check, they said, "Oh, she failed because." I guess you had lied or something, whatever it was that they decided was your sin. Or laughed. I probably laughed. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> I would have failed for sure. Yeah. Um, so then they perform this Scientology version of an exorcism. What was that like? What does it entail? What are they trying to accomplish by doing this? Yeah. So um, what, I, what I remember of it actually happening, um, it's basically uh, – this tone 40 shouting, which is in reference to the tone scale in Scientology. And tone 40 is like the most intention you can have. So it's, for me, it was just really loud shouting. Um, and he's yelling at my body thetans to leave the body for a number of hours. Um, very scary for me. All I remember was being yelled at, but I wasn't being yelled at. Something on me was being oh yelled my gosh. at. You know, so um, I, I remember it as just this really odd, scary experience that I had. Um, but it's not actually like a process they recommend in Scientology. Um, my dad has acquired, you know, all of the knowledge that he needs being an, an, an OT. So he has actually taken this upon himself to perform this um, Scientology exorcism thing on me um most Scientologists would refer to it as like squirrel tech which is like off practice um Scientology or not by the policy Scientology it's how they would refer to it wow okay for those who don't know what is a thetan or why are they trying to get thetans off of you so yeah so you've got the thetan which is like you are a thetan it's your spirit your um immortal and you live life to life um on earth which is also a prison <laughs> lucky you wow <laughs> um and body thetans are basically like dead alien spirits that are you know lost and confused and they're all over you um from the moment you are born basically wow. 
It's interesting because it sounds very much or very parallel to Christianity in a way where, at least in Mormonism, growing up as a Mormon, we were told that we had Satan's little followers and demons whispering in our ear at all times. Wow. <clears throat> kind of the same thing. Like they're attached to you. And if you don't have the power of the Holy Ghost, which you get when you're baptized at eight years old, then you're kind of stuck with all of these little demons trying to tempt you and lead you down Satan's path. So it's interesting that it sounds very similar, although I don't believe that Mormons practice exorcisms. They just believe that the way to get rid of them is by being worthy and doing all the things you're supposed to do with the church. And if you sin, it's because of one of Satan's followers whispering in your ear. What, like literal little demons? <laughs> like, how does that <laughs> How does that work? It's so funny, like, having this conversation because that's exactly, that was my response when I watched your video. I was like, wait, <laughs> little aliens stuck to your body? How does that work? <laughs> so, yeah, it's kind of like, like, do they go to sleep? Do they, where do they, like, where do they hang out? Like, what, you know, what? the Holy Ghost goes to sleep at midnight and that's when they really <sighs> start trammering in your ear. <laughs> so funny when does it when does the holy ghost wake up though that's the real question <laughs> that is such a good point no one's ever asked that kelly wow that's a you really know good you know point. what actually i can't even take credit i think i was watching a video of you doing it and someone commented in a oh, live really? chat or in something and they said it so it's stolen stolen oh, that's comment, amazing it's so true it's amazing yeah so we both grew up with this idea that there are these beings that are trying to tempt you and make you do wrong things but in your case so you're six years old and you have your parents and these people that you probably look up to telling you that you are the reason that your parents are failing in business or their marriage isn't going well. What is that doing to your psychology as a six-year-old? So I was quite, I was very confused by a lot of it because I just didn't even really understand what they were talking about like I would be told that I was trying to ruin their business, um, trying to end their marriage, trying to cause harm to my family, trying to cause harm to Scientology. Um, and uh, I was made to confess to these things. But I also had this feeling of maybe I'm not conscious that I'm doing this. Maybe it, it's something I'm not aware of um, and I don't get why I'm doing this or how I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I doubted, I doubted myself because it was over and over again that I'd be told this um, when, you know, I wasn't trying to hurt anybody. I, I didn't have any um, evil intentions towards any of my family or, or even Scientology. Like I, I didn't feel those things, but because they were having problems, um, the, church has sort of two ways of looking at things there's uh you've pulled in your own um misfortunes illness or uh, pain and things like that you've made that happen or you're connected to somebody who is a suppressive person who is bringing that to your life basically right and they declared you officially a suppressive person, right? The exorcism apparently didn't work because this continued throughout your childhood. Yeah, I mean, I, they, I don't think they actually officially declared me because I think I think if they had put me up for the adoption or uh, sent me away, they would have declared me, but I think it would make it difficult for them to um, stay in, in the religion had they declared mm. me, so... They, as far as I know, there might be a declare on me somewhere. I actually don't know, but I, I haven't received one uh, personally. I was just informed that I was an SP for many, many years of my life. Um, and because they didn't enact disconnection, this handling process um, was what they used instead, which involved um, lots of sort of menial labor. I had to always be making amends for my evil intentions. So I would be... Uh, cleaning and cooking, taking care of my two younger brothers. Um, I was given quite a lot of responsibilities in that way. Um, and then I would also have to write up lists of my crimes. Um, I'd have to do sessions on their e-meter. We had one at home, which is their 
sort of lie detector thing. Um, and uh, I would have to sit on that until I confessed that I wanted to um, destroy their marriage, Scientology, and my family, basically. Wow. They are just forcing these confessions out of you because clearly you had none of those intentions as a six-year-old, seven-year-old, eight-year-old. Yeah. I wanted to mention because you you talked about in your video that you had to clean windows with newspaper. Yeah. <laughs> Here is a little side note. We did that too. Oh, good. Mormons did that too. <laughs> Because she said in her video, I, I found out that people don't clean their windows with newspaper. It's just a Scientology thing. And I was like, ah, Mormons do that too. <laughs> and I don't you know, know You why. know what though? So no, I don't know. I think, no, someone actually explained this to me because in that video, it caused some controversy, <laughs> the, the newspaper thing. It did. And, and I got people like typing in all caps, like, my grandma cleans her windows with newspaper and she was never in Scientology. And, you know, obviously I found it hilarious because like on this whole video, this is the thing yeah, of course. that you've, that you've pulled up. But, um, apparently the reason is <laughs> that there's some, something in the ink of the newspaper that makes the window shiny. So that's why it, it was done. It's like an old school practice, but okay. many, um, yeah, I, I guess it, it was included in, in a lot of um, the policy stuff. So like it, there must have been a policy with it, like you will clean windows with newspaper, that's the right way to do it. <laughs> so I was like, oh, this is like a Scientology, like clean the windows with newspaper thing. Also yeah. like of how much disdain um, Scientology kind of has for the media and stuff. I was like, oh, they're just like clean the, you know, I, it made sense at the time, but yeah, you know, yes, that's, it's not, it's not cult specific, apparently. Wow. Not cool. Well, our cults are famous for, well, first of all, they were invented fairly recently. So that makes sense that they would grab onto the quote old school practices because they have not evolved. <laughs> Neither of our quote churches have nope. <laughs> evolved from when they started. So yeah, that's funny. I always just thought it's because newspaper was cheaper than uh, paper towels. And so I yeah. thought, why are we like, it's so weird. Like, why are we doing this? Because we would have to do service projects where we would go to people's houses and clean for them. And we were kids. So I guess we kind of had the forced labor thing too, but it was seen as service projects where you would have a little book where when you're old enough, it was like 12 to 18, they had these, I don't think I've ever talked about this before, but they had these books. It was, shoot, now I'm going to forget the name of it. Um, you had it in what's called Young Women's and you would have to check off all of these things, these service projects, and then you could graduate from it. And we used to have to say all these principles and I could probably remember it now because it's the culty thing that's ingrained into my head where every young woman's you would stand up and say this whole thing about how you're dedicated to God and these are our principles, faith, divine nature, individual worth, knowledge, choice and accountability and integrity. And I think they've just added purity, which wow. barf, disgusting. But you would have to do these little service projects within every category and then someone would have to sign it off. So for girls, you would do things like knit a scarf or learn how to cook from a grandparent or a grandmother. They wouldn't say grandparent. Grandmother is <laughs> teaching you how to be a mom. Wow. Uh, but anyway, off topic, I just had to point out that we too cleaned with a newspaper. So getting back to uh, the meat of this, what were the auditing sessions like for you? How, how long did they last? What was the point of it? Were Was anything actually accomplished besides them making you say that you were doing something that you weren't? Just explain to us what that was like as a child. Yeah, so the um, sessions themselves would go on for honestly hours, hours and hours and hours. And they would start off kind of chill I guess like you know they would ask you a question um like tell me about your morning um you tell them about the morning or whatever and then you would have to go over it again and again and again in more detail more detail um you know and it kind of develops like um you could say oh I was I went downstairs and I had breakfast and then I went upstairs and got dressed for school um you know and then it kind of extends that period of time to be like, well, what were you thinking about at this point? You know, um, were you having 
evil intentions about this at this point? Did you think this at this point? And it, it's gradual. Um, and it, it's like they make little gradual changes to this story um, to lead you into this confession. And for me as well, these sessions would be done at like three o'clock in the morning sometimes. Um, my mum was actually an alcoholic. Um, so if she was arguing uh, with my dad or something, um, you know, they would come to the conclusion of, of um, well, we've got this SP in our family, get her downstairs, mm. um, you know, and I literally would be asleep, woken up for this this session um, and would be put on the e-meter um, and, you know, asked these questions. If it was done like this, it was pretty much straight to the point, like, um, what are, what are your evil intentions towards us? Um, what have you been keeping a secret? What, you know, those kind of things would be asked. Um, and, um, it would just go on and on until, until I gave this confession. After that, um, I, I would have to like go and write like a letter of apology that I would wow. give to them, um, stating what I had done. Um, and what I would, uh, do to make amends and, and how I would fix that would be the kind of process of it. So when you told that part of your story in your video, I, my jaw hit the floor because not only are you being emotionally victimized and traumatized and spiritually traumatized, now you have to say that you're sorry for what just happened. It, it blows my mind that things like that are happening around the world, especially with kids. And it's it's such a cult specific thing too, which I'm sure it happens outside of cults, but it's such a yeah. it's such a telltale sign of a cult when you're forcing confessionals and then you're the one that's that should be saying you're sorry for it. Oh, it just it boils my blood to know that stuff like this is happening. And I can't even imagine how that was for you. I mean, I did confessionals, but they made me think it was my idea. Right? They, they forced right. the guilt into you so hard that you're like, I have to confess or God will not love me anymore. Did you have any existential thing happening during these confessionals or was it very much grounded in your reality knowing that you just had to make amends with your parents? Yeah, there was very much like a, a survival thing for me. Like I, I was like, I have to f fix this now because I, I felt unsafe. Like I felt yeah. unsafe um, being being this this enemy of them um, and needing to fix it. Because and I thought it was my fault as well. I was like, I I'm a bad person. That's why my life's bad. That's why I'm being hurt. That's mm. why I'm being punished. Is because I'm a bad person. Um, you know, and it's a big thing that kept me silent. Um, you know, when I did go to a regular school, when I did have normal friends, I was like, my life is only bad because I'm not a good person, you know, oh. I, I, and that's, that's kind of uh, what it left me with. And, and it's taken a long time. And sometimes I still have to like, you know, tell, tell myself that I'm not, and I'm just, just a normal human, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's so awful to to live with. And at one point you mentioned that you couldn't even eat with your family and they would leave food at your door. It's so heartbreaking. How did that manifest physically in the out in your outside world as far as the stress that was going on inside and the turmoil? Did it have an effect on you and like your day-to-day -day life? Um, so it, at home, definitely. Like I um, was very isolated away from, from everybody. Um, people used to, well, my parents um, and, my, and my brothers were made to too, uh, freeze me out basically, um, which was like, you would walk into a room and uh, they're not allowed to acknowledge you, not mm -hmm. allowed to acknowledge that you're there. Which, you know, it doesn't sound th that awful, but when it's for weeks on end every day, it's just, it, it's, it's sends you a bit crazy. And my experience with, um, like school and stuff when I, when I went to, uh, public schools, um, I got along with everyone. Like my teachers liked me. Nobody was punishing me. And I was like, I'm, I'm okay here. Like things are all right here. And I almost 
developed like um my personality like at school where it was safe and at home I would just go back to to being quiet to trying not to um upset them trying not to be accused of being evil um you know uh, and all of all of that I don't know if that answered your question I'm sorry (laughs) yeah no no it did and um some of the other things that you had mentioned were pulling your hair out and that is I mean it's it makes sense because it's a coping mechanism and it's something that you have control over, you know, the self-deprecating type yeah. of behaviors or self-harm. And I'm so sorry that you had to go through that. I can't even imagine. You mentioned that you went to public schools and also Scientology specific schools before you were homeschooled from your mom. What were some of the differences, the the big differences that you can kind of discover now or probably at the time you're like "Hmm, this is not like my other school what were some of the things that you had to go through in Scientology school yeah so I I went to Greenfields for a little bit it's the only Scientology school in the UK it's quite close to St Hill which is one of their big um, organizations it's sort of like a castle in East Grinstead um, and my parents went down there to do courses. So I only actually went to Greenfields for like six months. It wasn't a very long time. I was like eight years old, but we did lots of word clearing. Um, if you like were sat in a lesson and, uh, you didn't, uh, if you yawned or something, you would like have a dictionary put down in front of you. You had to look through the words you had been like reading about that day to figure out like what you've not understood properly. Oh my gosh. Um, it was so boring to do that. So, so boring. Everyone would hide their yawns like to try not get caught. Um, and um, I, the, I don't remember loads from the school, but I got in trouble there because at the end of one class we had, um, everyone was expected to clap for L. Ron Hubbard. Um, and I didn't do it. I was like, <laughs> what? Like, nah, I'm not, what? Like, this guy is on, like, audio tapes that I have to listen to in the car. Like, he's well boring. I'm not bothered. <laughs> I'm not doing it. Like, that sounds so bad. <laughs> like, it was just... Yeah, I was I was like, well, I'm not a Scientologist. Like, you know, it's fine. No, it was not fine. Like, you're not supposed to say that, apparently. Um, you know, and, and they had... Someone, some... Like, three other kids had laughed at what I had said. Um, and from what I remember, we were, like, sent outside. And we literally had to just, like, move stones from a pile outside to, like, another pile. And that was our... Punishment, punishment for doing that we did like running laps and um some cleaning and things like that but yeah i i don't i don't remember much more than that from the school um after i was there we went and got homeschooled by my mum she decided that was the next best thing uh where she would try and teach scientology to us um we did this home version of the purification rundown uh, which is where you're in a sauna for like five hours a day, taking crazy amounts of niacin. Like it makes your skin all red and itchy. It's horrible. Um, and then trying to teach us like training routines where you're uh, staring at each other for two hours, not allowed to move, um, not allowed to laugh. Um, which progressed to like bull baiting, which is where you have to sit in a chair and have somebody shout abuse in your face without reacting. You just have to sit and take it for a couple of hours to pass it. Um, You know, so we did a lot of that at home, um, which sucked. (laughs) It sucked. It was horrible. Um, Yeah, so the main difference is between that and a a regular school was that you know at a regular school I had regular friends regular lessons fun um and yeah I wasn't uh (laughs) wasn't doing all this crazy stuff so what is going through your mind when you're doing the the staring and the aggressive well I guess someone would be aggressively yelling at you are you just Are you just forced to suppress all of your emotions and not react? That's how you pass it is if you don't have any reaction to this verbal abuse. Yeah, absolutely. Um, You can't 
react even a positive reaction if you were like laughing or giggling you know um smiling anything is a, is what they call a flunk um you know they literally go flunk like here we go we're going to we're going to start again um so you know it's kind of funny at first and you're like oh whoops like whatever but then you realize that it's not going to stop until you can can sit through it basically um and you do i just you just like tune out you know you like zone out of of the fact that there's somebody yelling at you zone out of what they're actually kind of saying to you and mm-hmm. and just accept it you have to accept it and it's a major part of um what um like the Scientologists will always talk about having their TRs in their training routines in um and it's all about communication and how Scientologists communicate with one another what I don't understand is how that's supposed to make you a better communicator if you're just completely dissociating from your body and becoming numb to these things. You would think that they would teach you how to integrate your emotions so that you could more effectively communicate. And also, if this is meant to help you communicate with each other, but they're promoting yelling awful things about that person in their face, that also doesn't very it doesn't seem very helpful to do that. How is this translated? In your day-to-day life, or at least at the time, did you find that that shaped your personality when you did finally go back to public school? Were you kind of dealing with this numbness that was forced into you? Yeah, definitely. Um, and I will say on your point you just made, like, I don't get it either. That's that's why we don't run cults, Shalise. Like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't get it either. Um I I don't know um, how it's supposed to make you better. I was told that it would help me like confront bullies and and be able to deal with people saying uh, like mean things to me. Mm. But it's you know it's I don't know if I can say bollocks, but it's bollocks. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and and yeah, there is there is a level of that. But to this day, I still can't deal with someone shouting in my face. Like I think I was just bad at it, but I've I've never been able to like uh, deal with that. And even to this day, if someone yells at me, like I will cry, and that is just <laughs> that is how it goes. Um, but there is there is a numbness for sure. That's a normal thing, though, to feel upset when someone's screaming at you. I don't think trying to teach that out of someone is actually healthy because it is normal to have a physical emotional response to someone yelling at you so of course hey, i agree <laughs> <laughs> yeah another thing i wanted to touch on is they actually invited you to become a member of the sea org but you had the knowledge yes. or the intuition to be like nah i'm not doing that tell everyone what that was like there was a period of time where my uh, mum had asked for some Scientologists to come over and give us some assistance at our house. So they came around. There was two of them. They were both OT8. So they, they had the most knowledge of everyone. Um, and one of them was outside talking with my mum and the other one had pulled me aside. Um, now, boarding school had been something that was constantly thrown at me i've seen more boarding school brochures than (laughs) books probably (laughs) well no maybe not but you know um and um they're like look um they brought this the contract and they were like we think uh you should join the sea org you'll be able to go out on a ship um meet some really cool people and all of that. And I had just started doing lots of um, like music kind of related things at school. So I was, you know, learning instruments. I was in bands. I was doing all this stuff. And I, in my 12 year old self was like, oh, you see, that's not going to work for me because I'm going to become a famous singer. So amazing. I, I don't think, yeah, I don't think the ship thing is going to work. And then they were, <laughs> they were like, Oh, well, you know what? We, we have all access to these like festivals and you'll get to meet like all of our Scientology celebrities and you'll, you'll, you know, you'll be, we'll be able to give you that opportunity to achieve your dreams. And I was just like, nah. And (laughs) I had already got like really good friends where I was, um, and some people that I really, really, um, loved and trusted. So I didn't want to leave where, you know, where I'd built these friendships as well. Um, and I was just like, nope, not, not doing that. (laughs) 
Wow. I can't believe they would. Appro- I mean, I can now that I've done interviews with Scientologists and realize they don't believe in, quote, children. But nope. <laughs> asking a 12 year old to sign a billion year contract without their parents knowing is insane. It's absolute insanity. Yeah. Do you think if you would have signed it, would they have taken you away right then or after you finished school? Oh, I don't think they would have waited till I finished school. No, I think they probably would have got me there as soon as they could have. Um, I don't know if they would have literally taken me that day. Um, and I'm glad that I will never know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it, it was like, a, I, I was very much in the way um, for my parents, you know, and this uh, narrative of me being this problem in their life went on for years, you know, like if you think I'm 12, it's six years of me still being an issue for them. Um, wow. And to the, the the person that came to recruit me, I think it was a way of um, helping them, you know, helping my mum by getting me out of the way. So, wow, I never considered that. And I'm glad you put those pieces together because before you said that, I was thinking, why would they try and recruit someone who's, quote, a suppressive person to a high honor, I guess, of being a Sea Org member? But that makes sense, trying to get you out of the house so that your parents could thrive again. At what point did that end or did it end, your parents calling you a suppressive person or being the issue of or the root of the issue of their problems? Um. Well, we we didn't end things in a in a. Uh, amicable way I they left Scientology when I was 14 um they'd realized that it was kind of a lie um my dad was seeing that all of the new courses were just more self exorcism of these aliens and was like okay you know maybe I'm out now um and they left but I was still kind of a problem for them they struggled with um the sort of mindset of of what they had learned in Scientology because they had been in for like 20 years. I, mm. I say now, like, I think they, they struggle to um, admit that, that an SP wasn't a real thing and yeah. because they'd have to come to me and be like, we shouldn't have done that. We've done all these things and we shouldn't have done them. Um, I, I think, it, I honestly think it was, was too much. And um, I don't know if if some guilt played into it, but we were not having a great time. Um, and uh, when I was uh, 16, I turned 16 in November and by the December, they were like, you got to go. Like, you got to get out of here. Um, we're going to put you somewhere, uh, which they did. They put me in a like a bed, a bed sit, which is a sort of room in a house full of other strangers. Um, and... Yeah, I I stayed there for a while and I didn't go back and hadn't had contact with them until my dad reached out uh, two years ago, um, or or I had with my mum since. Oh my gosh, that's so incredibly difficult. I can only imagine being out on my own at sixteen. When they said we don't believe in Scientology, we think it's made up, it's a scam, or whatever it is they said to you. What was going through your mind at that point? I feel like if it were me, I probably would have yelled at them and said, I told you, or why did you do all that to me? Yeah, or I all of this it. was for nothing. Are you kidding me? What was, did you have that kind of interaction with them where you were just like, see, I told you, or how did that manifest after that? So I, I never talk back to my parents. I would never dare uh, mm. say something like that to them. Um you know, I I was quite like, you know, are you okay? That was that was kind of how I was about it. Um, you know, I knew that, you know, I didn't believe in it, so I was like, well, this is rubbish anyway. But um, yeah, from from what I I remember, I I was very just like, okay, I didn't ask for an apology, I didn't ask for anything. I just didn't want to, um, you know, I was quite afraid, afraid of them. So I wow. was quite just quiet, really. Yeah. And that's naive on my part. I should have considered all of the trauma that you had been through talking back to them and the relationship that you had. Now that you can talk to your father openly about it, or I'm assuming you can talk to him openly about it. 
What are those conversations like? Has he since apologized or have you had any of those kind of coming to term conversations? You know, it's a it's a slow it's a slow process. It's a long kind of road to to get in there, but we we have had some conversations about it. He's very much like, you know, if you have questions or anything like I want to own my part in it. We mm-hmm. we talk by email. He has never um apologized to my face. Um and I struggle with that a little bit and you know I imagine it's hard though as well like I I can imagine that's difficult on his on his end um but I I have lived a life without him I've lived a life without him without my mum and and with people that I know that um love me and and that I love as well so it's hard to have to establish a a new relationship because I feel like he's a stranger and I don't know him, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's kind of better to give a, a this, like a, I guess a, like a blank slate, but th- there is a feeling of, of wanting um, the acknowledgement of it. He has seen um, my videos. He has seen uh, me talk and do some of these interviews and he has actually been really supportive. And he's like, I'm glad you're, talking out about Scientology um, and and he knows that it doesn't paint him in a good light, but he is, um, understands why, why I'm doing it. So that's, you know, that's kind of where we're at. I don't know that that's a a great um, answer, but, you know, it's a process and I hope it can get better. Yeah, it's a good starting point and I can completely relate to that. Um, similar situation with my dad, but wow, I want to know, and I'm sure everyone else wants to know how you were able to dig yourself out of this mile deep hole and become such an amazing person and a lovely person. What were the steps you had to take to get out of this, not only with your mindset, but physically getting on your feet, figuring out life when you didn't really have I don't want to say the right way, but a healthy way modeled for you. Um, so um, during my time at school, I was like 14. Um, I, I had been having some like mental problems. I was quite depressed. Um, I was struggling with an eating disorder at the time. I wasn't um, eating normally. So I, it got clocked by some of my teachers that maybe things were not quite okay or something mm-hmm. was going on. And you know, I didn't really talk about the Scientology stuff or anything. Um, you know, they, they had noticed like my parents wouldn't show up to, uh, parents evenings or, um, concerts or things that, that I would do with school. They were just not around. So they were like, Mm -hmm. okay, you know, uh, friends of mine used to be like, are your parents drug dealers? Like, where are they? (laughs) Like, that's what my friends used to say to me at school. And I was like, no, no, they're not drug dealers. Um, (laughs) and, Literally, um, you know, so they they were clocking that there was some something going on. I was quite afraid to to talk about them. Um, you know, I was afraid one that I would get punished or something, and two, kind of still felt like it was my fault. If I was mm. a better person, my life wouldn't be like this. I wouldn't be being hurt like this. So it's kind of my oh. fault. So I can't really diss them for it. You know, so that's that's where I was at, and. You know, slowly, um, there were a few adults that I, I really did trust. Um, and, you know, I would kind of like drip feed some of the information, like a little bit that I would feel safe to say. I would be like, oh, you know, like um, I have to do these like e-meter things at home with this like lie detector thing. And I have to say like what what I did wrong you know, and I would just say it just plainly like that. And they would be like, what? Like, what? what is going on? Um, and it was so uh, difficult. I've talked to those adults since and they're like, we had no idea how to deal with this, how to, mm-hmm. um, you know, how, how to, to, to deal with this information. And we also couldn't get you to tell us anything Um enough for us to like step in you know like um to get like social services involved or something like that um so all they could do they they tried to help me with my like eating disorder problems they they put me into uh, uh, cams which is a a child therapy thing 
um, you know, and, and it was the same there. I would spend every week just, just joking around, like trying to not talk about my home life, anything I could do, um, until, until I got kicked out. Um, and I was put into this little bed sit thing, which, like I said, uh, house full of strangers. There wasn't a front door lock or anything. Um, and I felt quite unsafe there. And I told yeah. some of the, the teachers at my school, like, so, you know, I've been kicked out um, and this is where I'm staying. Um, I might have to leave school. I was doing my uh, GCSEs, which is, I don't know what the equivalent is in like America and stuff, but it's like some exams you do uh, before either leaving school or going to college. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was doing that and I was like, I might have to drop out because I need to get a job because I have to pay rent now um, in this place, which, which they went, what? Like, sorry, what? What, yeah. what are you talking about? Um, you know, and um, they they were so, so kind and helpful to me. Like they, they stepped up to this crazy situation that I had kind of, been slowly trying to trying to tell them um and and stepped up to help me with it um they came and checked on me in this place you know because I was already there it was done um and they at least they, they came to check to make sure that it was okay and and help me with like groceries and things and then they were like we need to get you funding so you can continue your studies um and I had to go to a solicitor to get like um, my uh, guardianship passed over uh, to to another adult. Um, mm. If I didn't, if they didn't agree to it, if my parents wouldn't agree to sign it, sign the guardianship over, then I'd have to take them to court, which was wow. really really scary. Like I didn't want to, I didn't want to sit there and have them in court I was 16 like I, I don't yeah. know how to do court like I've seen I've seen crime drama and that is it <laughs> like I don't know what court is outside of that um you know and they agreed to do it uh they they signed me over to an adult they'd never even met before Whoa. um and you know this this person that that did sign this um I, I don't give her name out online just because I feel like it's a scary thing to do. But my nickname for her is Mark. So we call her Mark. Um, and she, um, me and her are still incredibly close to this day. Like uh, we, we are such good friends and, and she helped me with lots of stuff in that um, emotionally, uh, physically around me, what was going on. Um, you know, I, there was, there was somebody there to make me feel, um, safe and heard. Um, and, and without, without, uh, this group of adults stepping in then, um, then I wouldn't have, uh, I, I would have just given up on myself. I think I, I was so encouraged and, and told like, you're a good, you're a good kid. Like you, you got this, you can, you know, we, we're here for you. We want, we want to listen to you. We, um, we don't think this is right. What has happened. And, and nobody had ever said that to me in my mm. life. So I was like, okay, like, okay. <laughs> um, sorry. I was so ranted then, but like, you know, um, that, that was that experience. It's almost a, a blur like of that, that year that I left was so hard because I was relieved even though it was horrible because I was yeah. going to a place where there, that was full of strangers that anyone could just walk into and where there were people doing drugs on my roof. Oh my but I gosh. wasn't walking on eggshells. I wasn't scared of getting hurt when I got home, yeah. even though I really should have been like, you know, because I wasn't at home anymore. Um, the, the only thing that was awful about it all was that um, I, I was going to a school where my two like younger brothers were going as well and they were not allowed to talk to me. So Ugh. I would see them every day and I wouldn't be allowed to talk to them. And, and I hated it. It was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. Um, and I had, I had been caring for them um, 
you know, probably from when I was 10 years old, like getting them up for school and making them breakfast, making sure they had lunch, making sure they got there, making sure they got home. Like I was the one taking care of them um, because my mum wouldn't get up till four o'clock in the afternoon, you know? Oh, wow. Um, And and it, it honestly crushed me so much to not be able to talk to them um and and they did eventually go you know what we're gonna talk to her like <laughs> one of them you know and and um I asked them like why why didn't you talk to me like why why didn't you even ask me what had happened and they were like well um mum said that if we talked to you or if you were around or involved with us like she um she was gonna off herself if you were around or in the house and that's why she got rid of you oh. and that's why we couldn't talk to you either. So, it, you know, um, yeah, learning that was d- just... My my mind was blown. I couldn't even believe that she would ever say that. Um, you know, and I'm so grateful that we're in contact now. Like, um, me, me and my brothers have have a good relationship we talk and and you know we all we all know we've come from a bit of craziness Mm -hmm. um but we try and deal with it the best we can you know wow so you had two younger brothers were they ever targeted as an sp or were you the sole target of the family um well while i was there it was me um when i left i found out that some of that uh, did get passed on Mm. um to them as being the problem, um, you know, because it could never, never be my parents' problem. It, it was always one of us. So right. um, they were sort of shielded from it while I was there. But um, once I was gone, yeah, they, they were subject to that a lot. Um, and it, it's something I feel like guilty about. Like, I, I hate that I couldn't um, stop that from happening to them. Um like I know it's not not my fault necessarily, but I, yeah. I I feel guilty for it. Yeah, and I'm sure you have those feelings. But as an outsider, I can also say that is 100 percent not your fault. And also, even if you were there, I think it would have been extremely difficult to shield them anyway because you already had that dynamic with your parents, and I'm sure they wouldn't have listened to you. I think. What happened happened, and of course it's not your fault, and I'm sure you feel a certain type of way about it, but as an outsider looking in, I'm here to say you don't have to feel guilty for that, and it's not your fault, and I'm sure they're doing a lot better now. It just speaks to also the programming of your parents because when you left, they were no longer Scientologists, but they still carried on that pattern of blaming someone else, right? They weren't still in the church at that point. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. No, you're exactly right. Oh, I, my heart hurts for you. I mean, I'm proud of you now. Everything that you've accomplished in your channel and speaking thank out you. and helping other people, it really, truly is amazing and brave and difficult. So thank you for doing what you're doing and being so vulnerable and sharing your story. I know it's not easy to recount those difficult parts of your life and I've done it as well it's like yeah. it's almost re-traumatizing every time you have to talk about it so I applaud you for doing that and I also want to get your opinion as to what other people can do if they're in a similar situation what advice would you give someone who might be the 14 year old version of yourself struggling trying to get by trying to yeah. unwind the indoctrination what would you say to them I would say if you're a young person and you're you are in a similar situation to this, whether your family is in a cult or not, um, you should try and reach out to some some adults that you trust. Um, it can be really hard to to establish that um, with with um, teachers or anyone like that. But if you know an adult that you feel like you can trust them, friend a friend's parent, um, anybody you uh need to need to try and and tell them uh what might be happening right now um if i could have uh told somebody earlier knowing what i know now as as an adult um i I would have said something sooner there's a level of confidentiality that that you can have with with these people that you know it's not all gonna go wrong it's not all gonna uh blow back in your face I know it I just know it's hard to to have that trust and I would say 
um, whether it's a friend or somebody that is outside of that situation, um, if you can open up about it um, and ask for help, then ask for help. There are people there who will be able to help you and will not think that you are um, a, a bad person or, or doing anything of the sort. Amazing. I agree. The mentality part is probably the hardest because there's a level of shame that comes with going through a traumatic thing, even though we can logically say that wasn't our fault for going through it. There is this layer of if I tell someone they might think differently of me or they might think that I'm weird or wrong or yeah. how could you be so stupid to fall for that and couldn't you just critically think your way out of it? That's not always an option for people, especially when you're born into something and you are so no. conditioned yeah. to believe you are a certain way. You're conditioned to believe that the world works a certain way, that people are always out to get you. That's a big thing with religious cults or cults in general is us versus them. Yeah. They're out to get you. If you go to that side, then you'll be tempted by Satan or Thetans or whoever it is that's trying to bring you down. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's so hard to unwind all of that and deprogram and also reprogram. Yes. And something that you said earlier about how when you were still physically not in a safe space, you still felt liberated and free and safer than you've ever felt. And I know yeah. that feeling all too well. Not the physical safety. I, I can say I've been lucky in that I've always felt physically safe, but emotionally and spiritually safe, not so much. Because yeah, when your whole totally. world tumbles around you, it's exciting and freeing. And oh my gosh, I can figure out who I am now. I can make my own rules. I can do what I want to do. And still with that intent of being a good person, it's not like, oh, I don't... I won't get in trouble from God for murdering someone, so I'm going to go murder someone. No, it's, that's not it. Usually people are very trepidatious about sticking a toe in the pool of sin, if you will. Yeah. But it's also terrifying because now you don't know the answers and you don't know who to turn to and you don't know who you can trust. So I 100% know the feeling and can empathize with you and anyone else who's watching who's going through this. So I would just say, be easy on yourself, forgive yourself, yeah. easier said than done. But taking those steps to healing are so important and it may be quick. It may take years. For me, I'm still unwinding Mormon programming after leaving 10 years ago. But it's it's hard, but it's worth it. I guess that's the long-winded way of putting it. It's difficult but it's worth it. And just like you said, Kelly, there are people who are willing to support you. You just have to reach out. You have to yeah. break down that barrier of I'm wrong. Something in me is not perfect or not worthy and extend a hand. So after saying all of that, are there things that you are doing now that you would like to share that are helpful for, helpful for you? My goodness, I can't speak, guys. I'm on 3 a.m. Bali time right now. <laughs> It's like, is okay. <laughs> my brain is like, what's happening? Um, <laughs> are there things that you have found have helped you, whether it's meditation or cooking or something that you found have found grounds you into reality and helps you heal? Um, it's a good question, actually. Like I in terms of things I, I've done in this period of time like to to recover like I've done I've done a lot of therapy okay guys like I've done a lot and of that's therapy. amazing <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know and and there is uh things in that 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 are great and also if you're talking to somebody who doesn't know what it is to be in a cult they're never going to be able to to fully understand mm -hmm. that and you know I have got come to a place of, of understanding that um but I will say um being being around people who are um positive good uh fun people it was it was something that i that really helped me um you know uh live my life and 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 uh let the joy i have inside of me out like that was always there and i was never allowed to do it so so being around people and and having friends is such a good thing from all different, you know, religions or backgrounds, different things um, that that 
yeah, that that's something that I found helpful. And, um, you know, I don't go to therapy anymore. I've decided Lego is my therapy now. <laughs> so I have a lot of Lego. Like that's what I, that's what I do in my free time. It's very like calming and, and all of that. And in terms of the Scientology stuff, like, you know, my dad only started talking to me during the pandemic. Um, and we're talking about Scientology and, and, and going through it. And, um, you know, I, I did have a YouTube channel at the time and I was, you know, I was putting makeup on my face and turning myself into a lizard. Like it was not that <laughs> deep, you know, we were just, we were just having a good time. Like, you know, I was bored. So we were doing that and I was talking to him and I was like, I, I need to share this. I need to, I need to, I need to share this because if there is somebody that, that was like me and, and, and so confused and, and about it or what even happened to me, then I need to put this out there. And in, in trying to understand his involvement in it, I was trying to understand Scientology because I, I don't myself identify as somebody who ever fully believed in, in the doctrine of Scientology. You know, I didn't do the bridge. I didn't, um, go through all of their training and I wasn't in the Sea Org. Um, so there are parts of it that I had no idea mm. about ever. Um, so I, I was trying to research it, also talking to him, trying to understand things he was saying to me to, to get it. And, um, I, I ended up going like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make myself like a, like a documentary thing on this. Um, you know, and, uh, and I put it together in in a in a series that I made. And I love editing. I, I'm a video editor, so I I was like, all right, I, I'm gonna learn everything I can. I'm gonna put it into some kind of an order <laughs> that makes sense to me, uh, and and I'm gonna put it out there. And and that was really cathartic and and quite helpful for me actually to to do that um, process as as a way of coming to terms with it and, and understanding it, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. Make a series, buy some Lego, get a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> buy some Lego. <laughs> so good. I, <clears throat> I think to also, from an outsider's perspective, consolidate that as well is finding hobbies that just make you happy. Whatever it is, like Legos, for me, it's dancing. Dancing has always been an outlet of personal expression. Ooh, what kind of dance? What oh, kind yeah. of dance do you like? <laughs> well, I grew up doing every type of dance. So I did the studio thing, jazz, tap, ballet, hip hop, clogging. You better believe I won some clogging competitions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cheerleading in high school, it was drill team. And now it's salsa and bachata. So any Latin dancing, I just absolutely love to go out to that's cool the club <laughs> things and just go nuts because what I love about social dancing with bachata and salsa is you don't have to know choreography you just have to know basic steps and then you can social dance and freestyle with anybody and it's so much fun to do that it's such a release so for me it's about yeah coming present again, finding that consciousness, if you will, that sense of self, and then also getting lost in it. So when I'm on the dance floor, just completely forgetting who I am, what's yes. going on, what I have to do the next day, what episode I have to edit, and just let go, I think is so nice to find your presence and then relax into that. So that's my my 100%. therapy, although I probably would benefit from an actual therapist. <laughs> If you know any good ones, no. <laughs> you know, music, music is a great is a great therapy. Like I've always loved to sing and stuff, like in yeah. choirs, in, in bands, whatever. Like, you know, it's something you can do as part of a team, isn't it? And mm -hmm. and you can like um just enjoy the moment and the thing that you're doing right there. Like, yes. you know, so I, I totally get that with the dancing. I'm a horrible dancer. <laughs> horrible, but <laughs> But I love music, so I, I can identify with you on this on that. Yeah, you play the music and I'll dance. Beautiful teamwork right there. Love it. <laughs> Cults to cabaret. Yes. Oh my gosh, I love it. I need to get your Linda Listen moment sassy statement that you want to say to anyone or an organization, or if you want to turn it into advice to our listeners, that's up to you. 
Yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to be savage today. She's, you know, <laughs> I'm in my congenial era, so you know, I. <laughs> I would say, what is it? Listen, what is it? Lid- Linda, look, or is it Linda, Linda listen? listen? Linda, listen. Linda, listen. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to say that if you have gone through any sort of adversity in your life, whether it is a cult like what we talk about here, um, whether it's um, an abusive relationship, um, any, any, anything like that, I think to know that there is um future there is hope i fully believe that time is a beautiful healer and even if things seem bad right now like they can and will get better um and you've had the strength to go this far so you can uh, go the rest of the way too that's beautiful beautiful advice you're welcome linda i said you're welcome i second that advice (laughs) thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story it was incredible it was heartfelt inspiring uplifting um towards the end all of the the good things so i really appreciate you coming on and sharing do you have any final thoughts before we go I I would say thank you for having me. Um, I think what you do on this channel is wonderful. You've got some incredible um, guest interviews and and your whole um, ethos here is epic. So, you know, thank you for having a platform where where, um, people like me can come on and and share a story with you like that. You're a wonderful interviewer, a great listener. So, um, yeah, I really appreciate that. (laughs) Thank you so much. Well, everyone, go follow Kelly. What is your YouTube handle? I know if you type in Kelly Copter, it'll come up. But what's your YouTube handle? That is it. Kelly Copter, right? Like helicopter, <laughs> but with a K. I love it. Um, you know, I provide in-flight ed- entertainment. <laughs> um, we're talking about cults at the minute. You know, I hope to delve into some other things, maybe um, maybe some conspiracy, some true crime. Ooh. You know, I'm fascinated with sort of the dark corners of society and what is going on. You know, I think that is a side effect of having a kind of experience that that you and I hope I wonder if you would would attest to that as well um you kind of get a bit fascinated by all all of these strange yeah uh, groups these strange rules and things so yeah that is kind of what I what I do there um yeah I was gone for a year but I'm back you know I've landed again so (laughs) yeah I think the interest in cults first of all everyone's interested because whether we like to admit it or not everyone is fascinated with the dark corners of the world and yes I am too probably from my upbringing because you want to feel less alone and oh weird stuff is happening over there too let's see how they feel about it so yeah here we are cults of consciousness uh how do people find you on Instagram uh, you can find me at the underscore helicopter. Um, yeah, and my picture is the same on on both of them. So, yeah, that's that's the easiest way to find me. Come Amazing. say hello. Yes, go follow and subscribe to Kelly. And uh, thank you so much for making it this far. And if you like the channel and want to support me as well, I would love it if you could become a patron at patreon.com slash cults do consciousness. Thank you, Stephanie, for becoming my newest patron. I appreciate you. And I swear, I keep saying I'm going to get new content up there. Now that the wedding is over and I can take a breath, I will be focusing more on the Patreon, uploading content just for my patrons. So again, thank you so much for watching. And until next time, follow your highest excitement to be conscious and be well. Thanks for listening. If you like what you hear, it would mean a lot if you could like and subscribe on YouTube and leave a review or a comment to help with our visibility. You can also find me on social media at cults to consciousness or reach out by email at cults to consciousness at gmail.com.